Now, over the last two years, Indian equity markets have seen an unprecedented influx of young retail investors. And as we begin a brand new year onto the EG Money Show, we thought of bringing these new age investors or Gen Zs to our studios and understand their investing mantras and philosophies. And to help them understand the markets and resolve their queries, we have an equally Gen Z expert with us, Keetan Shah, who is the founder and CEO of Credence Wealth Advisors with us live in the studios firstly let me welcome on board all the young gentlemen that i have uh, with me onto the studios thank you so much for joining us today on et now so much. what we'll do onto the show we'll try to understand from all of you how your investing journey has been and what are your uh, views on investing and we'll also try to resolve the queries but before i come to you and get a small intro of yours to our viewers Firstly, let me come to Kirsten and understand from him how your investing journey has been and were you also one of those Gen Z's in age back then when you started investing? Shristi, thank you so much for having me on the show. Uh, of course, yes, I belong to a Gujarati family and uh, while I was, I'm not, not even sure, 10, 12, 13, 14 years old, I used to give those paper slips to the brokers, right? And I would not know what am I exactly giving it to the broker. But over a period of time, I really realized uh, what I was actually doing. So it actually kind of ran in the family. And it was not, not something new for me to be a part of the stock market. If I'm not wrong, I think I was 21, 22 years old when I actually bought my first stock. And uh, of course, I'm educated in the commerce field of things. So these things uh, came naturally to me in that sense. So yes, I was as young as these guys are. But uh, fortunately, unfortunately, I was not... Uh, well educated or aware during my times uh, when I bought my first talk like these guys are. Okay, that was very interesting to know, Keithan, but now you are advising a lot of investors out there and they look up to you. But just wanting to understand before I come to these young gentlemen, uh, how do you find a difference between the Gen Z style of investing and maybe the millennials and people who are even before then in investing? Is there any difference that you spot out there? There is a big difference and I'll tell you my own story, right? While, while I was uh, investing, at that point in time, we didn't really have the technology, nor was, you, nor was YouTube such a big thing where, you know, people came and shared their experience about investing, taught you how to invest. We largely have learned everything the way uh, a normal investor would have otherwise learned through newspapers and, you know, reading through books. I think today the world is very different. Because uh, even a even a 15 year old can you know log on to any of these channels on the YouTube and start learning. Uh, the biggest difference that I see is that people like me when we started, you know, mutual fund was not as big as it is today. So for somebody like me to invest in mutual funds at that point in time was also as good as doing options trading today. Uh, but today you talk to these young guys, I think thanks to internet and specifically thanks to uh, Corona and technology. I think everybody's become a day trader, an options trader, and uh, they think it is so easy to make money on a daily basis. And thanks to all the inspiration that they keep getting from social media where people say making money is so easy, I think uh, there's a huge difference the way we really invested when we started investing versus what the younger guys do today. Maybe yes, Keetan, because social media is now playing a big role in getting uh, that influencing uh, style of investing maybe. <clears throat> But uh, now let me open the floor and welcome on board all our young uh, investors out there and let me give them a short span of time where they can introduce uh, themselves to the viewers and through them viewers we'll try to understand how the Gen Z style of investing been and maybe Keithan will help them with the do's and the don'ts of investing. So firstly, uh, why don't we start with you Siddharth? Uh, so I basically started investing let's say in 2016, in my uh, very first uh, year of my college. Uh, obviously, like uh, Keetan sir said, that he actually started, you know, by sharing the uh, share, uh, share certificates to the brokers. So, uh, actually, my journey was almost the same. I used to see a sea of reds and greens on my father's screen and, the you know, the TV channels and everything. So, that was when the curiosity took over. And since then, in 2016, when I entered my college, so then I started investing and it's been a good ride till now. Okay, that's impressive. Dave, uh, what has your investing journey been like? Perfect. So I, I feel 
I've grown up in an environment. My family environment is all into stock markets. So basically, my dad, my brothers are all into stock our stock markets. So daily routine dinner conversation was around stock markets, and that is how I developed interest in stock markets. And my normal routine investments are majorly into mutual funds and equity market. Okay, so family influencing is playing the role out there. But uh, so Joy, coming to you. Hi, Srishti. Thank you so much for having us. Firstly, because it's. Really nice to get a fresh perspective. Normally, we're on the other side of the screen, <laughs> and now for us to kind of come here and give our own fresh perspective on things is really important. We feel valued as young investors, so thank you to ET now for doing that. Um, my investment journey started around 18, 19 years of age when my father was going to give me a birthday gift, and I told him this time instead of giving me something uh, tangible, why don't you give me a small basket of equities? Because you're always on about that, you're always speaking about that, you and your friends, everyone at home. Why don't you give me a small basket of equities? Then after the entire liquidity glut during COVID, I noticed that that small basket of equities had become a slightly large basket of equities. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. So that piqued my interest. Then I began reading, I began researching, studying. And then actively I began trading and investing myself. Then this entire last year happened, which was a great leveling ground. It was like a good humbling experience for everyone our age to see how equities actually work mm. and to know that it's not always going to be a merry ride. So since those days, since around 18, 19, I've begun investing. And till date, I'm following the market every day and I absolutely Understood. enjoy it. Yes, that's very interesting to know. But Keithan, what I understand is that all of them are very interested just in equities markets. I'll definitely open the floor for all these young investors. But the question that I have in mind, because now these people may be in the early 20s and going to be um, having their jobs in place, maybe their first salary. So not just in equity markets. From you, wanted to understand how important it is to start the asset and portfolio diversification from a very early point in stage and what important role it plays in investing throughout. I think, Srishti, that's a very uh, important question because like Sujay also pointed out, I think what happened during the COVID phase was largely everybody, new or old investor, started uh, thinking that, uh, you know, markets are linear. The only way the markets can go is up. But I think, uh, like Sujay rightly pointed out, 2022 was a very humbling experience where a lot of people understood that markets don't only go up, they can come down as well. And I think over a period of time when you mature as an investor, you will largely understand that the best way to do investing over a longer period of time is to have the right asset allocation in place. Asset allocation is something that will only come to experienced and matured investors because as young investors, we always are uh, all fancy about taking higher risk because we really want to generate higher returns. It is only going to be over a period of time that this maturity as an investor will strike in where you will uh, really start believing that asset allocation is actually the right way to do investing over a long period of time. If uh, personally you really ask me, uh, in spite of spending one and a half decades in investing today, I still make sure at the end of the year my allocation is in place with respect to my, my risk profile. So as an aggressive investor, of course, my risk profile is very different from how probably a moderate investor or a, or a conservative investor might have. But even if I have to tell you a very simple, uh, simple analogy, even if you are an aggressive investor, right, and you feel, why should I have 10, 15, 20% in fixed income? Just have 10, 15% in fixed income for the fact that the next time the market falls 20, 30, 40%, you will realize that you don't have additional cash to invest at that time, even when you know that this is the right levels to buy. So asset allocation might have a lot of opportunities for you, but the simplest of it is always going to make sure that you are aligned with your risk profile because you don't know who the winner is going to be the next year, right? Whether equity is fixed income, international gold, like who expected this year gold will top the charts? Nobody, right? So while you have an asset allocated portfolio, I think you are perfectly diversified and the risk adjusted performance of your portfolio is going to be far superior. Okay, so there's the point that being highlighted that how do you actually manage your risk because with asset diversification, you really need to look at this particular point. But let me just open the floor uh, to a young investor and try to know from them which is the other asset class that you wish to know from or something that you find very lucrative from you. Uh, so, uh, basically, I am more inclined towards, you know, international equity. Obviously, Nasdaq is down some 30% last year, but... 
obviously international market is something which we call as the mother market we call us as the mother market and then we obviously china is another factor where a lot of bullishness as well as bear, uh, bearishness is there at the same point of time so obviously i want to know about the international markets uh, so is that good question i think uh, while we are also trying to bring together portfolio diversification there is always this small uh, allocation that is always made to international equities but while you are looking at international equity my suggestion is that you first bifurcate international equity into two uh, developing and developed right and now now let's look at the larger markets while we are talking about developed markets you will typically have the <laughs> european zone and the us right now you go back and look at the data for the last one year three year five year seven year 10 year and you will understand that there is hardly any investment opportunity that you will see in the euro zone right so for me i am not really very excited as an investor to put money in europe yes when you talk about us i think uh, specifically while you look at uh, the it space and nasdaq that you rightly pointed out you know there is there is so much that happens first there before it actually comes to india or there are so many of these teams that really play out uh, uh, much faster and much earlier uh, specifically in the tech space in the startup space in the us that if you really want to be a very early mover in that space then you will really have to give some diversification there so while i try and build a portfolio definitely some part of that allocation goes uh, towards nasdaq in us amongst everything else in the developed economy now while you talk about developing right then you will typically see uh, brick which which plays out right the brazil india china russia south africa now you look at russia uh, we know what has happened msci is allocation to russia has almost become zero right there is not a lot of investment opportunity in south africa and brazil also because of their political and other problems that that typically go around now while you look at china right uh, china is a catch 22 right uh, while while you are looking at developing i don't see a reason why over the next half a decade or or over a decade uh, there is any possibility that uh, anybody would be able to beat the kind of pace that india is going to grow at so while in the developing space you already have most of your investments done in india right which helps you with the, the developing allocation there is very little room for me to really think that i want to invest somewhere outside of india in the developing space of course there are so many of these themes that you can invest in china which never really plays out in india or there is a very small allocation let's say ev right all of us keep talking about ev in india while you are talking about ev there is hardly a tata motors that largely you and i end up investing in because we want to play the ev thing where 60% of the global uh, batteries are manufactured in china so there are themes that you can play in china uh, but because you already do such large allocations to india i don't see a reason why except for us Uh, you would really want to over diversify outside of the country but i think um, siddharth and um, kisun what investor stock that we have they just highlight that india is the place to be <laughs> isn't it <laughs> because of the outperformance that we have seen but definitely point taken that you need to diversify and kisun also highlighted that he might look to have a small portion in that front but um, gentlemen we are uh, just uh, some short on time and we still have to discuss a couple of points so quickly from dev and uh, sujay would like to know which another asset class is something that you guys are looking forward to i would personally <coughs> want to know about cryptocurrencies the ever going buzz about cryptocurrencies okay. so as a young investor we've seen all the fluctuations in cryptocurrencies it can be lucrative as well but risky at the same point of time so as a young investor what do you suggest how should we invest our money in cryptocurrencies and that's a very um, different approach to the investors which i personally don't understand because in 2022 uh, it's a 65% correction and they still want to find value in that and that happens with a lot of penny stocks as well when we yeah. discuss stock markets so keith then what will be your advice on that i think dev uh, what i would really suggest to you is to first figure out whether you are an investor or a trader right because the answer will completely depend on what side are you choosing if you are a trader it does not really matter and you shouldn't be bother of whether there is an actual use case for cryptos or not right but let's say if you are an investor and you are looking at it from a 5 year 7 year 10 year perspective then i think what i would really suggest you is for you to be able to answer these two questions on your own right while you do investing there are two things that largely play out is there a use case right 
uh, uh, and why why would you want to invest uh, in cryptos where where it is not really regulated now if i have to tell you my view i'm not really a big fan of crypto investing and i'll tell you why so today while you talk about cryptos you talk about uh, you know it becoming the next uh, uh, payment mode right or it becoming the store of value like gold is right now my my simple question to you is that uh, let's say if today currency fluctuations and otherwise in terms of printing non printing and all of these decisions are taken by the central bank right if crypto comes in uh, uh, which the major objective of crypto is that uh, the power moves out of the hands of the central government or the central bank and moves to moves to more being an open source mm -hmm. now which government or which central bank is actually going to allow you to do something like this where they lose control right so for me uh, and you and you look back to whatever governments globally have been doing in terms of putting on restrictions on on crypto right uh so i don't really think it it can actually become uh the mode of uh, payment or so called currency in the future because governments and uh, central banks won't allow you to do that also while you talk about store of uh store of value which gold currently is again if you look back uh, you know central banks when the russia and the ukraine crisis happened central banks actually leapt on to buy more gold and nobody bought cryptos so i'm not really a, a a big fan of crypto investing there are a lot of use cases that might uh, you know develop in the future because of blockchain as a technology but definitely not a store of value of mode of mode of currency yes and the sharp fall that we have seen in the crypto markets definitely don't suggest that um, you should be looking out to uh, invest but definitely you can <coughs> get your self a bifurcation between a trader and an investor on that front but so joy quickly coming to you which is the asset class that you look forward to so the asset class which i want to talk to is like an asset class within an asset class so recently we've had a tremendous number of uh, shares which have ipoed and debuted recently where there have been sky high multiples attached to them revenues being multiplied by x number which is not used for normal brick and mortar companies so what i genuinely want to know from kirtan is that are these actually justifiable especially given the sharp dip in these uh, recently debuted stocks that we've seen so yeah that's a very interesting question and i don't really want to name stocks here but uh, definitely i see some value now in some stocks that debuted a year year and a half back and now are trading probably 60 70% lower look what we have to understand is while we are talking about these new age digital companies is that the world specifically in terms of investing in india has has not seen or valued companies which have not made profits right so far you talk to any professional uh, investor and that investor will tell you look at the last 3 or 5 years of profit growth roe roc debt equity ratio promoter holding and all of that most of these things actually get tossed out when you talk about these new age uh, digital stocks right but at the valuations at which they were uh, originally uh, issued i think those valuations were bonkers and even if you look at uh, some discussions around new ipos coming in the same space at some 100x valuation of what the profits were made right i don't really i i really don't fancy investing them at the ipo stage mm. but a lot of these uh, companies are probably moving towards profitability uh, the management commentary has been that they will turn positive over the next four quarters or six quarters they've been making a lot of efforts seriously to become profitable and hence those companies at the current valuation at 60 70 80% down may look interesting but not the entire space for sure okay so we have discussed about having an international exposure yeah, looking at the crypto world as well as some of the uh, some of the value investing ideas as well but uh, kirtan um, because we are just about to end this segment what we understand is that all the young gen zs that we have in the studios they are uh, definitely into equity markets for now but how important it is to have a goal defined for your investment maybe because with the equity investment they will try to outperform the other asset classes is what i believe and maybe looking at their enthusiasm i'm sure that they will reach out to that but apart from that how important it is to have a goal uh, defined investing i think shristi that's the most important thing because uh, the biggest problem in investing today is the behavior 
right? Uh, because you've probably experienced uh, something the way you were investing in the past, you develop a behavior, right? As a trader, as an investor. As a trader also, you know, it is not very easy to be able to digest the volatility in the market. And, and, and as an investor also, you know, while you've seen the stock go up and then come down, you can't phantom the chances of how long do you really want to hold on to the stock because you've seen the stock at a higher price. So I think the biggest learning uh, of mine as an investor and now as an advisor over a period of time is that the biggest thing that you really need if you really want to become a successful investor is, is discipline. And discipline in investing can only come if you really have a target. Right, so uh, these guys are pretty young, but uh, they might they might not really understand why am I saying this right now. But uh, what if I tell you that the age of 21 is the right time for you to start looking at planning for your retirement? Because today, the kind of money that you will have to invest to make sure that your retirement is taken care of is far lower than than the kind of money that you will have to deploy probably if you start 10 years later. And when you start with an end goal in mind, let's say retirement, right? You know for a fact that you've got 30 years to go before that goal actually realizes. And you know at the 5th year or the 10th year, if you stop investing, you'll not be really able to reach your goal, right? And hence, the goal actually brings in the discipline that you want and that automatically makes sure that the returns that you are anticipating are the ones that you are making because you've been a disciplined investor and a long-term investor. Okay, so that's the advice coming in on goal investing. But before I end this discussion, would like to know from all our young Gen Zs, uh, wh who are your role models? Because you guys have already shared your journey, right. especially into the equities. So, Siddharth, can we start from uh, you? So, I've learned a lot from Mr. Peter Lynch. And obviously, <laughs> nowadays, uh, I act actively follow the Kamath brothers. So, these are the people, you know, who I actually learn a lot from them and it, the journey is actually for long and forever. Hmm. So these are the people. Okay, Dev? So basically for me, uh, I've always been into long-term investing. So Warren Buffet would be one uh, person who I look up to and the, the statements about the compounding effect and the benefits which we get from compounding is what I always have a goal for. Okay, so Jai? So I'm going to go with Dev at least. <laughs> Internationally, 100% Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are top there for me because they've taught us a very simple thing that the road to stupendous wealth is unglamorous. It doesn't involve something incredibly complicated. What it involves, as Kirtan very rightly said, is patience and discipline. And domestically, I had the pleasure of interacting with Mr. Nemesha, the co-founder of Enam Securities. And he was kind enough to tell me that, young man, you understand one thing, that when even if you're buying one rupee of any share, or any tiny amount, do it with the attitude that you're becoming a partner in their business. And make sure that right now all your tailwinds are there because of the liquidity and everything. But when the headwinds come, make sure that your stocks are still at the wicket and still at the pitch. So he's definitely a role model for me that I've always looked up to. Okay, that's very interesting to know that all the legends out there in investing are uh, someone that our young retail investors are now looking forward to. But Keaton, who is your ro role model, if I may ask? I actually <laughs> always kept following late uh, Rakesh Junjunwalaji. I, uh, I've been really excited with his journey and what he's been able to do. Uh, and uh, I just hope that I'm able to walk the path. Well, absolutely, because a lot of people look up to you, but definitely the Warren Buffet of India is somebody that we look forward to. But with this, I uh, would like to thank Keithan for joining us today on the studios and all your young Gen Zs and wish you all the best for your investment journey. And we hope that this discussion will help not just you to define your investment journey and horizon from now and to all the Gen Zs that are looking up to uh, this particular show and they may have some guidance on their investment going ahead. Thank you so much. But with this, it's time to slip into a short break, but we'll be right back. <laughs>